super. So we're really happy for that. Anyway, so hopefully we'll have, um, we'll be able to connect a little bit. And um, yeah, so let's just give just people just maybe one or two more minutes to, to settle in and log on, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, maybe we should just go ahead and get started. We can always have discussions, right? All right, so let's go ahead. Um, yep, welcome to ECHO, free online CME. Next slide. And these are our sponsors as, uh, as usual. Thank you so much. Next slide. And just a reminder that we should keep everything HIPAA compliant, HIPAA compliance. We need to create a sort of safe learning environment and hopefully we'll be doing some sharing and encouragement. Um, next slide. And that, you know, uh, during the series, uh, not only talking about age-friendly health system practices, but also exploring well-being and also exploring QI strategies and um, reviewing some updates on uh, COVID uh, regulatory guidance. Next slide. And a reminder that in order to receive CMEs, um, you have to complete the evaluation and, um, and then, yeah, then the, you'll have to, uh, then you'll get them. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is just a reminder that if you would, there's actually an opportunity to get age-friendly health system recognition from IHI as nursing facilities. Um, and I know you guys are doing that already. Um, so if you really would like to do that, um, there are workbooks and it shouldn't be too complicated. Just let us know if you are interested. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then, so this is a part of a four-part uh, four, um, four What Matters series. And so we've done um, February, March, April, and today we're talking about care plans that matter. We've been talking about what matters to the resident. Next slide. And this is just a short introduction of our hub team. That's me, the course director over there. And we have Dr. Takenaka, and I'm hoping that she's gonna join us like very momentarily. <laughs> uh, we have Gail Rodriguez, you can say hi who will help facilitate. We have Dana Mitchell from Mountain Pacific and we have Laurie Henning from HAH. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm gonna let Gail share. So last week I, I brought up um, four little um, things to think about for our well-being, and, you know, I know that COVID was um, took a lot out of us the last couple of years. And uh, I wanted to just kind of touch bases on one of the things that um, I did, um, but also for you to think about. Um, on rest, you know, I, I thought, well, what is it to have quiet time for me? And, um, you know, with all the texting we have, the emails, the phone calls, um, social media like Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And at work, we have so many interruptions that we never really take the time to get a quiet time. And so how do we actually do that? And even when we're driving um, to and from work, you know, we're listening to music, there's all kinds of audio um, talking, talking on the phone with our car phones. And so what do we do when we get home? You know, what, what do we move? You know, what do we think about when we get home? Like everyone is looking at their phones, our families. And 
there's kind of no social interaction within your own family, um, no real interactions. And, you know, it made me really think, you know, like really we, you know, we go to work all day and we're doing all of the same things. Um, so there is no rest. So how do we restore and how can we create and how can we communicate um, to people, our husbands, our children, our family members? So I look more into the quiet part and um, I was able to con connect by just listening, like quietly listening, um, observing their facial expressions, um, you know, see how other people are interacting and, you know, understand what they're going through and and why they're, you know, why they have this need to have to be on, you know, Facebook or Instagram. Um, because once you start really listening to other people, um, you actually can start having your own feelings like empathy, um, you know, feeling, feeling for other people, where the social interactions on the online takes you away from the real touch, feel, and the feelings of empathy and why we're so stressed at work is because we never get to really, you know, our residents are doing, you know, are being, are not having that as well. I mean, I know that we opened up for visiting, but, you know, everything is kind of um, timed, you know, like don't spend too much time or they're outside and we're not really watching um, all of those interactions. And, you know, with the COVID out again, you know, the, the new variant, um, and I know the community is high at this point and we're having to test again. Um, it's really important to retreat to our quiet place um, to pull us out of that stress and really, really show some love and understanding to your family and, and examine yourself. Um, so in all things we do um, every day, um, at least try it for a week and see if you can really manage that quiet time. And then remember what um, you are, are missing out on because you're missing out on a lot if you don't sit back and, and do that quiet time and what really matters to you. And pretty much that's what I thought of this week and I wanted to share that. Thank you so much. Yeah, the slide made me think a lot too. Thought about actually, I thought about creativity. You know, I never made never making time for that, and that's really what gives me, you know, rejuvenates me and stuff. So, yeah. trying to make time for just even a little bit of that. So, yeah, yeah it's a good reminder. Have to renew ourselves with somehow, some way, somehow. Right, right. Make time for that because the no, renewal factor is really important. You know so that you can really be your best self yeah thank you mm -hmm. anybody have any renewal stories you can just type it in the chat box and we can all be encouraged and challenged okay and in the meantime let's have Lori um share with us um covid updates okay thank you let me share my screen Hey, hi everybody. It's nice to see everybody here today. So I do just have a couple of updates to share with you and then we will look at some data. So everybody in the nursing home setting is well aware of the NHSN reporting. And last month they announced some changes to the COVID-19 module pathways. They are going to be removing the supplies and PPE pathway. And then they're reducing uh, some of the required reporting elements within resident impact and facility capacity and the staff and personnel impact pathway. So you can see those on this slide. They're going to be taking away the COVID-19 test type, vaccine manufacturer for the RFIC only. Um, they're gonna remove that section on other respiratory illness and then testing performed and the time for receiving results. And then they are adding expanded vaccination status options for boosters. And then they're gonna have a simplified PPE shortage question. So an effective date for these changes hasn't been officially announced yet. Um, some folks have talked about that they heard it was gonna be May 16th, others said May 19th. 
But regardless, CMS is going to be hosting webinars this month in May to review the updates and revisions. And we'll be sure to get the word out when we hear about it. So you guys can uh, make some time to attend those as well. And then just as Gail was talking about, here are our community transmission rates as designated by the CDC. So this is for the last week. We've got May 1st through May 7th. Um, and again, the CDC looks at two metrics to determine this. They look at the new cases per 100,000 over the last seven days and the percent of positive tests over the last seven days. So as you can see, all of Hawaii falls in the red, placing us at a high level of community transmission. And therefore, all of our nursing facilities are following the CMS requirement to test staff who are not up to date with their vaccinations at a rate um, of two times per week. And then just another reminder that you'll see, like if a county falls into two different categories, like you see here with Hawaii County, then you always use the higher of the two to determine that transmission rate. And then we're gonna go ahead and move into data. I don't think any of you are gonna be surprised by this, because as we all know, COVID cases have been ticking up within our state. So this is the latest information published by our Department of Health with a date of May 2nd. And as you can see, the daily cases and test positivity rate has been on the rise in all counties. The total confirmed COVID-19 patients and hospital beds in our state has also been increasing. So again, now that we have the ability to test from home, a lot of folks are watching this number as an indicator of how we're doing and the impact on the healthcare system. So these next three slides are showing you you know, kind of our journey on this duration of the pandemic from uh, September of 2020 all the way through um, here at the beginning of May. And then the total confirmed COVID-19 uh, patients in an ICU bed um, in our state has also risen just a little bit here recently. I gotta say, we enjoyed a bit of a lull after the Omicron surge, and now we're seeing the total new COVID-19 hospital admissions per day. Again, it's on the rise. So I know we're all keeping an eye on this to kind of see what's gonna happen during this time. So this data again comes from the CDC and it's for last week, April 28th through May 4th. Um, it shows that Hawaii, again, you can see that our, our infection rate here has increased and we had the 37th highest rate of confirmed infections per 100,000 in the nation. But when you look at the duration of the entire pandemic, and again, March 7th, 2020 through May 4th of 2022 um, is the dates here, Hawaii continues to have had the lowest infection rate in the nation. And again, for last week, Hawaii had the 28th highest death rate um, in the nation. And again, as we look at the entire duration of the pandemic, Hawaii continues to have had the second lowest death rate in the nation, second only to Vermont. It's just right there with them. And then this slide shows the rate of confirmed uh, infections and deaths per 100,000 in Hawaii. So when we met last month, the data put us right here. We were at 65, um, and now that number has climbed to 217 per 100,000. So as much as many of us feel that we are ready to be done with COVID and get back to you know, some sort of normalcy, it is still with us, and it's important to maintain the precautions that we have in place and to keep educating our residents and visitors on the proper infection control procedures that are in your facility. So we can see that the severity of illness resulting in hospitalizations hasn't been as significant um, that as we saw with the Delta variant or Omicron earlier this year, but there is still risk, especially to the vulnerable population that we serve. So Keep encouraging your teams to stay strong, to follow those IPC procedures and communicate with residents and families and step in to guide them. Um, I'm hearing stories about kind of some of the interactions and, and some of the, uh, everybody's coming from a little bit of a different belief system um, 
with regards to COVID and tolerance around it, um, but help them to stay informed and to maintain the infection control practices for the safety of all involved in your facility. So that includes you, your staff, residents and visitors. So um, I just wanted to thank you guys again for all that you're doing. You really are making a difference and we appreciate you and all the efforts that you're putting into this. So thank you. Dr. Wen, that's all I have, so I'll hand it back to you. Okay, so Maria Castillo had a question about where are you finding the positivity percent on the CDC tracker? Is there a, a trick? The positivity percent on, um, let me take a look at that. So is that for the COVID-19 transmission rates? Maria? Yeah, I guess we can unmute, huh? You could. <laughs> yes. Hi. Oh, good Hi. to see you. Yeah, um, because I look at the tracker data on the CDC site um, for the transmission levels and the positivities are never published there um, where they have the number of new cases, then the cases per 100,000, the percent change, but not the test positivity rate. So, if you're talking for the community transmissions rate, they did change that recently, how you have to go in and find it for the facility, because you've seen that, right? The first map that you get to is all sorts of colorful and largely green and yellow and blues, um, and that's the public one. And then you have to go down and, and click into um, the- uh, Transmission level. The transmission levels. And right. I'll send that to you. I can actually send that out so that you have that and, and how to find those percentage rates because yeah, we no, just draw them off that. on a weekly basis. I have it, but when I look in that section, the positivity rates, the positivity percentage, the percent positives, that's blank or it says NA. Oh. It, it okay. just gives the number of new cases, the number of cases per 100,000, the deaths, but it doesn't give the percent positivity. Okay, let me look into that and I'll send you okay. what I have on that. Yeah, All right. put it in the chat or just send it to us or share it next time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. And so I completely appreciate, Lori, what you're saying about how we all have to stay vigilant and everything. I'm just frustrated because the rest of the world <laughs> out of long-term care has decided the pandemic's over. And here we go again, right? It's our staff getting exposed out in the public. Everybody's in quarantining. And, you know, I mean, we can only keep it out so much when we're sitting in the middle of a community that has decided we're through. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. It's just getting harder and harder. You know, people don't want to wear masks when they're visiting, they want to eat with, you know, we're trying to maintain all this stuff that we've been doing for the past couple of years, but nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to. So I don't know, it's very challenging. You're absolutely right. We were actually just talking about this right before this session that you come out and you see, you know, Gail was saying, you see half the people in the grocery store is not masked up. I mean, people are, they're ready to be done at this stage. Um, you know, and, and there's an element where we can understand that, right? This has been a really long haul and, and really difficult and exhausting. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm hearing stories also in facilities of just, you know, how that is going. And sometimes seeing those folks that are not following the proper procedures and stuff are just kind of like frustrated and giving up, right? To be like, oh my gosh, how many times do we have to say this? But really and truly, you know, just encouraging your staff that it's worth it to get back up and, you know, keep trying to inform those visitors and those family members, because you're right, it's, it's spreading, it's in the community and it's, our numbers are going up and we wanna do the best that we can to protect the residents in our care. So it's absolutely frustrating, but I think, um, you know, having that awareness, some of these folks are no longer hearing as much about COVID anymore. It's not as much on the news. And so, you know, walking into a healthcare facility and having the staff approach them and give them, you know, the tools that they need to say, hey, we're, we're still here. We're wanting to do the best by your mom or your grandma or dad as, as much as we possibly can. And we hope that you will join, you know, this with us, join in the fight with us and, and help us while you're here. Thank you. All right, let's move on. We'll have, we have Dr. Cody Takanaka here and she is going to Talk about what matters, care plans that matter. Thank you.
So today we're going to talk about care planning in terms of what matters to the patient. Um, and it's always a challenge. We're going to start with a case. Um, we're going to meet Mr. Tayana. So he's 87, he's divorced, uh, and he's a recent admission to your facility. Um, he has a history of dementia with some progression in terms of functional loss. He does have incontinence, um, frequent falls, and behaviors that are becoming increasingly difficult to manage at home with the family. Here are his other medical problems. High blood pressure, COPD, a current smoker, GERD, constipation, arthritis, diabetes, and weight loss of 10 pounds in the past three months. Next slide. Here's his social history. He's divorced and has five children. There's only one of them that really keeps tabs on him. And she's been kind of his primary caregiver, helping him stay afloat at home for the past four years. Is a high school graduate, retired construction worker, history of alcohol use. Uh, he has um, eight siblings who are still alive and live on Oahu, but it's mostly just him and the daughter. Next slide. Uh, so we find out what was his home environment like? What was happening before he was admitted to your facility? We ask Mr. T what, what matters to him. Uh, and he vocalizes to us that he values being able to go out and smoke cigarettes like he's always been doing at home and have his plate lunch and his soda. That's, he's on the local bully diet, I guess. <laughs> um, and his daughter really wants to just focus on whatever makes dad happy don't cause too much problems. So she just kind of lets him do whatever he wants. Here are his medications. Uh, and this is a fairly heavy duty diabetic oral regimen, along with some treatment for COPD and constipation. Next slide. In terms of mobility, uh, we know that he has a history of fall, so we're gonna assess what's going on with that. He actually does have a front wheel walker. Um, maybe it was given to him in a past hospitalization. We know they just kind of accumulate those at home. He had three falls in a past month before he came to our facility. Um, he doesn't really use the walker. He just kind of furniture surfs. You hold on to things around the house. Um, now we know how dangerous that could be depending on how stable a piece of furniture is. He feeds himself, but when you watch and observe a meal, not all of it gets to his mouth when he's feeding himself. Sometimes the food falls off of his spoon. And he can use a urinal if somebody helps him. And he wears incontinence briefs at night. Next slide. Fermentation. We know he has a history of dementia with behavior related problems. When you ask about orientation, he's disoriented to time. Uh, and even in terms of recognizing his family, he gets disoriented to who the daughter is. He often refuses to take a bath or change his clothes when prompted for help. And when the caregivers try to help him, sometimes he's been known to yell or try to hit them. During the day, mostly sleeps most of the day and the daughter thinks he's up at night, not sure. And so it'd be interesting to kind of figure out, wait, when are these falls also happening as well? And here he is. He's, he's at our facility now. Heaven's loving nursing home. <laughs> this graphic oh. phone. This is what we meet. This is very common. It's giving me flashbacks. I feel like I've met a couple of these people in just the past week. I want to go home. Next slide. Okay, here's our first week. It's pretty rough. In terms of mentation, 
he's really unhappy. He makes sure everybody that comes into contact with him knows this. Uh, he doesn't want to participate in any of the fun activities, no matter how much music and fun, bosu ball, taiko, drumming you have. Uh, he doesn't want to even participate in daily activities like changing clothes, uh, refuses to take a bath. When we try to help him with feeding, he tries to spit out the food or close his mouth or try to hit them if he's assisted with feeding, um, but is insistent that he does want what he wants, which is his old standby, the, the soda, the plate lunch. He wants some sweets or treats. Um, and the family, you know, you can tell when they visited because she brings that in for him. In terms of mobility, there is some push and pull about smoking cigarettes, which is not allowed in the facility or on our patio or the outdoor area close to the nursing home. We're familiar with this, but he keeps on trying to get out of it because he wants to go smoke. Who's going to go with him? Where does he go? Uh, he can't stand on his own uh, without one person assistance and some gate belt to help with the front wheel walker. And the daughter notices that he's been getting weaker. This is not, this is not how, how much help he needed at home. He continues to lose weight, um, four pounds since the admission uh, to the nursing home one week ago. Uh, and so this, this is continued weight loss, right? Next slide. We try to get him the meds on his med list and it doesn't work. Uh, we review his med rec uh, and he takes about, his meds about half the time. Uh, sometimes they try to crush it. If they crush it and put it in applesauce or whatever he likes putting, um, you're not fooling him. He spits it out. Uh, blood pressures are uncontrolled. Oh, you can only imagine what is his sugar like um, because the family's bringing in stuff to kind of placate him, but we don't know because he's not really allowing us to check his finger sticks to look at his glucose. Um, and we know that he's only getting about half of his um, metformin and the glipizide. What matters again? We talk to him. Is there anything that we can do to make this the easier transition for him? And he's pretty firm about expressing that he wants to go home. He feels like him, he's in prison. Everything that he wants to do, he's told no or met with resistance. Family is worried because they really do notice a change that he's unhappy there and he's still losing weight. He doesn't seem to be eating well. He's always hungry and asking her to bring something for him to eat. The staff is worried because they know that there's a fall risk and they notice how often he tries to get out of bed without help. Um, we get calls from the dietitian about weight loss and you know his poor appeal intake. He has poorly controlled diabetes, high blood pressure. Uh, we can't really get him to take his medications. Uh, and the behaviors, which we're worried about the staff uh, when they try to assist with ADLs. Next slide. So let's think about this. This is not an uncommon situation, actually. Uh, all of you are probably, uh, <laughs> anyone who has cameras on, you guys see you guys nodding your records. Oh, I know this guy. Uh, we feel for them. We feel for the family. We feel for the team because we're now we're going to make a care plan. And we're going to think about the four M's. Um, and so to review, we're thinking about what matters to the patient so we can focus on what, you know, how can we focus this care plan around the patient? And so we can align the care uh, with what their goals are for um, healthcare outcomes uh, and what is important to them. We're looking at the medication, trying to figure out, okay, well, if he doesn't want to take his medication, how much of this is really necessary? Is there something that we're crushing and putting in meds? That tastes horrible, like um, metformin, probably, <laughs> when you sneak it into applesauce, causing him to spit it out most of the time. Uh, mentation, is all of this stress of the transition making his mentation worse? It's definitely affecting his emotional stability. We already know that there's dementia in the picture as well. 
and we've already seen a drop in his mobility. So what we, can we do to enable him or maintain his mobility? So we see some feedback here. Joseph Cohen needs nicotine replacement therapy, probably a patch. Yeah, if you know, if we're gonna tell him no, you can't go out and smoke whenever you want, we try to care plan a, an alternative uh, that would help kind of reduce that craving, which you know is not as easy to intentionally think about quitting if we're dealing with some short-term memory loss and dementia. Anybody else have other ideas for his, for M's care plan? You can unmute if you want. Yeah, no, John, can you um, just forward the slide? Oh, asking him what will make him happy uh, might help with the mobility and appetite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we could ask him about what matters in terms of what his wishes are. How do we meet these goals for the resident and the family? And think about, okay, we might not be able to say yes to everything, but how can we balance that? How can we find a happy medium between what everything that they want um, and keeping him safe? Uh, and to find something that the patient and the family might be agreeable to. That's a challenge. What about advanced care planning? What's going on with this family situation? You know, I'm just thinking sometimes, you know, when families don't, when patients, they have unrealistic plan. I mean, they have unrealistic goals and you sort of have to sit back and really get to know them and figure out, well, what's a realistic goal that we can target? You know, we, well, we can't we can't go home so we can't do that goal but we could try a different goal and what's really making you unhappy is the smoking mm -hmm. thing all right let's be creative here what can we do for you you know we have another comment on the side asking him what will make him happy oh we went over that one some residents can't stop smoking so what we do is set times with the resident for smoking and take them out with someone who also smokes as well if you happen yeah. to have somebody that goes out for smoke breaks. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, do you think a lollipop might help him? <laughs> Nicotine plus a lollipop? <laughs> some smokers, yes. Some no. smokers, no. <laughs> no. It looks like Dr. Khan has tried that. <laughs> sugar, the withdrawal from sugar. Yeah. Uh, stimulates the nicotine urge again. Oh, you no. Have to, you oh, got to no. keep the sugar so stable when you're smoke. trying to wean off nicotine. Yeah, OK. Well, I guess not. Then the nicotine patch is going to have to, well, maybe give him other things to chew on, something oral, right? Some other oral stimulant. So we do have a question to ask. Is it more expensive to have 24-hour home care as opposed to nursing home? What do you guys think? I know many of you know this answer. <laughs> we have social workers on. You might be able to do skilled nursing at home as well. It, it, let's see, the problem is getting the staff to do it sometimes or oh, to take them out to smoke. Is that what you mean? You guys are allowed to unmute yourselves, you know, <laughs> if anybody wants to speak up. Hi, this is Kimahi. Sorry. Hi. Um, hi. So that uh, comment was more for the 24-hour home care. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little hard to get the staffing to provide that many hours sometimes. Yeah. So that can be a barrier. Yeah. It's a but struggle that would be to better find for enough people and in a timely manner. Yeah. When we think about advanced care planning and we look at this family situation, it's like watching a, a situation where you know something at some point is gonna get harder or there might be a catastrophic event sometime in the near future with so many risk factors. Um, what do you guys think about this family situation? 
five kids, only the daughters around. We need to support the daughter if he's going home. Yeah. You know, she was already struggling before he was admitted. But also, it's a good question to ask. Is the daughter already designated as the alternate healthcare decision maker? Is there any documentation that exists that helps her make decisions for him? Um, because he might continue to ask for unsafe things. Um, the good thing about him is that he can say what he wants, more or less. Um, so even if you have a conversation regarding like code status, pulse form, for example, with a patient and the daughter, he might be able to understand and say enough about what he wants for himself with the daughter present, um, which at least might help you get things down for advanced care planning in terms of end of life planning. Any other thoughts? Have you ever had the situation where it's only the daughter shouldering a lot of the responsibility? And once you put a plan into motion and everything is ready to go, the oldest son shows up somewhere. They, they're usually on the East Coast. <laughs> and they're a lawyer or something, or a doctor. <laughs> they with, a, like a, with an advanced directive out of the somewhere. <laughs> yep, and they're on the complete opposite side of the page, and now you got to restart all the conversations yeah. again. <laughs> so it's important to figure out who the stakeholders are because there are other kids, even though only one is showing up for things, um, so that they can hear what matters to him while he can still express it. Um, Gail says he, she also notices that he may be in pain. If that was a picture of his hands on his face, he doesn't feel well. Uh oh Would you say he's also, the, I heard that he was an alcoholic uh, and that it was said heavy alcohol use. Was that up until the time he was hospitalized? And so he, has he been going through withdrawal in the early stages of his uh, nursing home? That is a really good question, right? We don't know exactly the timing. And so it'd be good to hear a little bit more from the daughter. Um, yeah, apparently she lets him do whatever he wants. So maybe she just, yeah, lets him have it. <laughs> Shall we go to the next slide? Hmm. So what would you do when we're thinking about our care plan for Mr. Tayana? Let's think about his mentation. Uh, we did talk about distress and pain, which is also very good, um, and his issues regarding mood. He does seem unhappy. Is there anything else that you guys are thinking about in terms of mood for him? Sometimes going back in time with what they used to like to do before can kind of help to have those activities available for them, and that kind of helps in turn with the mood sometimes, but that's you have to kind of learn and get to that point i guess yeah in order to know what what interventions to put in place that would help that yeah just figuring out what did he enjoy in the past um sounds like smoking drinking and eating uh things that he's not supposed to, it's not a good for him <laughs> welcome to america <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised if you talk enough to patients and their families that there might also be something special that is kind of one of their emotional anchors for, you know, like our wellness, our wellness thing that we we're talking about earlier, what helps to center them and people lose sight of that in illness or their families don't know. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of activities departments and specialists be really good at doing a full assessment with the patient and their family or their past caregivers. Um, so it's really nice to pull them into the care plan meetings. Uh, what about the issues regarding his dementia behaviors? What do you guys think about our care plan for that? This is very common, right? 
Well, trying to figure out triggers is important, right? Because if you can kind of figure out the trigger, that then hopefully you can prevent it that way. That's one way that we've seen works. Um, but again, you know, it, it's it's not always 100% ideal, but that does help sometimes. Yes. So really being able to figure out and talk with the CNAs or the nursing staff, you know, when when are these behaviors hazardous or distressing to the patient uh, or when does he lash out at the staff and what are specifically the triggers? Uh, just like Gail mentioned when they thought about pain, uh, is he uncomfortable because of his history of arthritis when you put him in that chair and roll him over the bumps to the doorway into the shower room? Uh, or is it something about moving him around in bed to change his clothes that exacerbates pain? Uh, it's really good to brainstorm about what the triggers for the behavior is, especially if we're going to think about interventions, uh, non-pharmacologic first, um, when we have those triggers. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, what matters to him. This is really the only way we're going to get to the non-pharmacologic strategy of helping his mood and his behaviors and I'm thinking, well, maybe he liked Las Vegas. If he likes the drinking and the smoking, there's got to be something else, right? So maybe we could find activities just that's what, you know, slot machines and cards and poker chips for him to play with or, you know, to play with others and things like that. And if we take him out of his what was me state, you know, we could um, find him some way to enjoy himself since he's still here. I mean, you know, so that's what I mean by, you know, maybe we can address both with what matters. And it sounds like he's actually quite depressed. He might be. I mean, anhedonia and, you know, he hates it here every day and it's a daily thing for, you know, maybe a small dose of antidepressant. Not that he would take it, but <laughs> have it in the room so he can smell it. <laughs> but... Yeah, but, but course, in the end, nicotine. behavioral activation is what helps. And of course, nicotine withdrawal causes depression frequently. Right. Mm -hmm. And alcohol. How many of you have dealt with a situation where somebody is so fiercely independent that just the transition of going from independent doing everything on my own to strangers doing my ADLs for me is what triggers a behavior? With or without dementia, <laughs> I have some completely cognizant people who really dislike this. Uh, so we're not exactly sure how advanced the dementia is. He was sort of able to get by with his ADLs on his own. Uh, and some patients have told me, I wouldn't hate it if people would tell me what they're going to do first. Uh, and not assume that all patients have dementia or need something done to them. You know, even verbalizing, can I help you with this? Asking permission. Yeah, it's, it is hard, uh, but we always have to try to find something. Yeah. I see. Shall we go to the next slide? Well, Gail said her icebreaker is to do the local talk story approach and ask what they did at work. Yeah. Sure. Well, high school you went. <laughs> the icebreaker. Very, very good. Yes. All of those <laughs> things. Anything. <laughs> Try everything. Well, you work for Harbor. Oh, that's the bet. You got the benefits. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like, where did they hang out? Because after work, they had to go somewhere to drink, you know? So just kind of finding out and if they open up then you know you can kind of make interventions towards that yeah. and if he was in construction you know you could find out which buildings he helped construct yeah and tell us about it right because <laughs> it, it does it does work they love talking about themselves mm -hmm. construction workers I'm wondering if it works, if it's helpful or not to ask about his friends that he used to work with. Yeah, yeah, I that is important. Is it? So really, you know, uh oh, is everybody freezing or is it just me? No, I hear you. 
I so see. really thinking about creative ways to get him to open up to us and think about, yeah, really what matters to him and what does he find value in um, to kind of find creative ways to address these things. Think about the behavior uh, and to offer alternatives that help safer alternatives for what he's asking for. Let's look at mobility. We're worried about the falling down and it's definitely declined since he was admitted to the nursing home. What are his issues regarding mobility? What do you guys think about this case? Alcohol, blood pressure, sugar. He's so many risk factors for falls, right? So, so this is like all of our geriatric patients. The falls are always multifactorial. We did think about pain. So managing pain that might also help with mobility. Or even and his mood. Oh, even it. his mood too, yeah? Like, if, yeah. I mean, if we can get his mood, mm -hmm. then he won't want to like just kind of lay in the bed or whatever. So that might be a factor. Yeah. I'm not even sure if he's a SNF therapy patient. We, we haven't really clarified that in the case, but I would ask, you know, would he qualify for any kind of therapy? Um, Cause maybe even though he was getting around at home, it didn't sound like an ideal use of his uh, walker. Yeah. Well, we can find out if he liked sports. I mean, maybe he did, right? I mean, smoking, drinking, construction he must have been fit maybe they went to see the basketball game all that maybe he used to you know and if we can tie something in there you know throw in the ball catching the ball in his wheelchair i don't know something nowadays more likely it was a spectator more likely uh yeah they have a television they have access to uh you know that kind of entertainment if he likes it uh-huh yeah you know, a lot of mobility for our patients is really tied to the independence. Yeah. And if, if a lot of this is kind of taking away from his ability to do certain things that he wants, can we kind of focus on helping to improve his mobility with a goal to address what matters to him? Yeah, sometimes it might be a, a negotiate, please at least try therapy so we can make sure you can fly home to Molokai. Uh, so, you know, you can get on that plane. I want you to get on that plane. Or, you know, can we make it a special event? What, hey, you know, plate lunch Fridays. Uh, let's work on a goal that you can walk with your daughter to the patio outside and have your plate lunch, plate lunch Fridays. We, we, we even buy the Pepsi for you, you know, so you guys can eat your plate lunch outside on the patio. Let's work on that goal. Love that idea. I use that too for our residents. Yeah, you set a goal and you move. Okay, birthday's coming up. You gotta. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. What about medications? He's refusing to take his medication and we're worried about, yeah, like we were looking at his blood pressure, his sugar, um, maybe even Tylenol that we're trying to give him for his arthritis. What are some issues regarding his medications? Maybe you can ask and start like with, with like, I'm trying to ask him why, like why does he not like to take the medications and see what his feedback would be with that? Because we always got to get to the why to kind of know how we can resolve anything, right? Yeah. I'm also curious to know, like, what, is this really what he was taking at home too? <laughs> Sometimes the home list is not really what was happening at home. If the daughter was letting him do whatever he wants, it'd be really interesting to find out what was really happening at home in the first place. Is she the one that was managing his meds or was... Was he even taking any of these to begin with? Did they do any labs or do we have labs in there? Like his A1C or to we see what? Might. <laughs> we might have some labs, uh, but we also don't know if that reflects uncertain medication <laughs> compliance at home or 
or was he really taking those meds? Uh, just like when they have a different home medication that said that they weren't really taking and the hospital starts all their blood pressure meds, by the time they come to the nursing home, they bought them out. So medication review by the pharmacist? Yeah. Is there anything about these medications where we can address what matters to him? Other than, yeah, definitely asking why, right? Is it the taste? Is it the number of pills? Sometimes I have patients that are really concerned and refuse and refuse until I come in and like three days later, they stop. This is not the orange pill I take. The one that I take is a purple diamond. <laughs> They're like seriously concerned because the appearance of the medication is completely different um, because they're used to taking, keeping track of their pills visually. I take one white oval, I take one long brown one, and then the purple diamond, but none of them are orange or red. <laughs> it's the wrong pills. Uh, so it's always interesting to find out why. Yeah. And to ask, will this be consistent with what his advanced care planning wishes are? Yeah, maybe he doesn't care if he dies. He's like, I just want to live, live it up until I die. You know, I eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, I've done that all my life. What's different now? Why are you trying to control my, my blood sugars? You know? And if that's his philosophy, well, people got to be okay with it. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. All right, so um, we're gonna go to the next section. Dana, take it away. All right, this is, the, I'm happy that this definitely flows really well after Dr. Takanaka's um, uh, case study, because this is, I um, pulled together person-centered care according to the regs and the way that they talk about what person-centered care is. Um, and so, you know, in that whole discussion, it was all talking about the resident being the focus and the center of control and how we have to support them in making their own choices, even if we may not necessarily agree with them or think they're the best choices. Um, the regs want us to try to determine how to best meet what they want uh, in a manner that they accept and that mitigates the risk. Um, and so you're trying to understand what they're trying to tell you, both verbally and non-verbally, in order to create a person-centered care plan. Um, you want to be able to understand what is important. We discussed that. What is was important to him for his daily routine and what he wanted to do. And understand what they were doing before coming to reside in the nursing home. That talk about construction management and dementia, you know, it always makes me think, are there ways we can bring activities in, for example, that, um, that he might enjoy that might have sort of a construction component if that is something that's still important to him. Next slide. Um, so what kind of care plans do you need to make with this information once you understand what's important to them? So um, I think this should probably be reviewed. We've got to have a baseline care plan now within 48 hours. Um, and it really has to get you kicked off for, for being able to take care of that resident as soon as possible um, and to do it safely. And um, you have to provide a summary of that, of course, to the resident or their rep. Um, then from that, you've got to develop your comprehensive care plan that needs to be done within seven days. Um, this, you know, for me, when I was working in the homes with quality was always kind of that pinnacle that, you know, you put the pin in the fact that we're trying to help folks um, attain or maintain their highest practical level of well-being. Um, you want to take into account services that they don't want, services that are specialized that they're receiving like rehab, um, dietary, those things. What are their goals uh, for admission outcomes and discharges if we think they're gonna discharge from our services? And we've got to ensure that obviously we're meeting professional standards of quality for the services we're providing. Next slide. Um, I kind of liked this uh, infographic from the Pioneer Network um, that is really just a graphic of planning 
the process for planning a person-centered care plan. Um, so we're taking into account the resident's choice. We are obliged to make an assessment of what um, their abilities um, or our ability to provide for the choices that they're choosing. Are they making choices that, that are creating a certain amount of risk or not? Um, if there's no risk, there's no reason why we can't honor that choice unless there's some, you know, corporate or other reason why we are unable to do so. If there is a risk, um, that's when we need to explore our, our alternatives to the choices that they say that they want to do or the, the things that they want as part of their care plan. Um, and this is where we work with the resident or the family. Um, is this alternative acceptable to you instead of this? Is this or not? Um, if they accept your alternatives, again, we want to work that into the care plan. Um, if not, if it's still unsafe or we've got inadequate resources, they, you know, this implies moving right to the decisions that you're unable to honor the choice. But I think that is a cycle um, where you're working together with the resident and the family. If that's we've got an alternative that they are not okay with is there something else we can we can work through what can we brainstorm how can we how can we make make it work in one way or another um and then everybody understands i know that care planning is is an ongoing cycle where you're monitoring your interventions and your plan and you're constantly reassessing and updating um, according to what works uh for the resident and what we're able to do for them next slide Can we have next slide? Am I frozen? There we go. Um, oops, sorry, go back one to the number one there. So, um, so in that process, again, identifying and clarifying resident choice, how do we do that? We interview them, we observe their behaviors or the things that they say during the course of care. Um, if you're speaking with them, make repeat back for clarification with the resident or the family, make sure you completely understand um, what they're what they are saying and that we understand what you know this word means to them or what this activity means to them um, and not putting our own interpretation on it. Um, we're involving the family if we if that's appropriate. Um, and again, if they've got risky choices, what are some of those acceptable alternatives? Next slide, please. Um, this just goes back to that step of discussing choice and options with the resident. Um, it, it's so important to make sure that we're giving them time and space to express what's important and meaningful to them. Um, that we are getting, this is that risk benefit conversation, the positive and the negative outcomes of their choices. Um, and how are they reacting to the options that you're providing for them if there's, if you need to alter in some way the choices that they're clarifying for you. Um, and they say specifically that you can include documentation of reactions that include, do they nod when you're giving them the alternatives? Um, do they laugh, do they grimace, or do they, they pull away? Um, that could be in the course of, say we've established an option and now we're implementing it, but they're showing us whether that works for them if they're not verbal perhaps. Uh, next slide. Um, again, some choices might be too risky to honor. They may not, may not be able to continue to let them drive. For example, those that are can be honored, we should have a plan for mitigated thinking ahead. If there's a potential negative consequence to the, to the choice that we're honoring, um, what's the plan to mitigate that risk? Um, you've got to clearly explain to them if if and why you cannot honor a choice. Um, and I know this last bullet, I think hits home in the last two to three years um, where we've got staffing concerns that may inhibit or prohibit a certain choice, a certain intervention on the care plan from being implemented. So can we think beyond, we don't have the staff to how can we still make that happen? If it's with family or friends, or if you work with, say a school or a, um, another community organization, is there any way to make certain choices happen even if you don't have staffing for your staff to do those things themselves? Obviously there are things you have to 
accomplish on the care plan that require your licensed personnel, um, but are there certain choices you can honor in other ways? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why this bulleted it out. I think it took it from the titles. <laughs> so never mind the formatting there. Um, but um, once you you understand what's important to them and the choices that they're making in their care and how they want to live their lives in the home, obviously we know we got to care plan it out through the IDT, monitor and revise it as needed with them and observe, obsess, uh, obsess. Sometimes we get obsessive, <laughs> observe and assess um, how they're responding to your plan. And then the QAPI component, they're always, CMS is always gonna bring in that QAPI um, component to providing care. So is your, is your committee, your QAPI team reviewing trends related to choice and safety that your residents are making in your, um, in your buildings? Especially if you're hearing or noticing that residents are being not denied requests or if you're noticing that you've got improvement opportunities, either by observants um, yourselves or by residents expressing concerns or caregivers expressing concerns. How are you pinpointing those areas to improve upon? And then what are your processes for doing that? Um, and the next slide is uh, just a couple of resources for um, person-centered care planning, according to uh, what CMS is asking us to do. Um, I included the process for care planning for resident choice from the Pioneer Network, um, and then one uh, person-centered care and resident choice from advanced senior care, just to, if folks are looking for additional resources or ideas to consult for that process. Any questions or comments? I was kind of breezed through there, but I'm glad we got the chance to work through that case study that is always a better way to learn, I think, in many ways. Thank you very much. So just want to say thank you for caring. I know this is happy nurses week and we just want to recognize all the, the wonderful, dedicated nurses out there and all the stuff that you're doing to really provide person-centered care. Um, next slide. And then finally, just want to uh, encourage you to um, as we're wrapping up our What Matters series, look for three things. Make sure you look for that, the power of attorney form. Make sure they have that completed and that they've designated somebody as their power of attorney to help make decisions for them. Um, in the event that they cannot, then it's somebody that they choose. So number two, make sure that part of that, there's an advanced healthcare directives uh, that actually designates, um, describes the types of things they would or would not want for their health care. And the third thing to look for is that pulse form to make sure that, you know, folks uh, have that completed and it's updated. And uh, so that way we can make sure we carry out their wishes. Uh, next slide. And if you can, uh, please share that with our team. Um, you will receive, um, actually, when you complete the evaluation and everything, you will receive a link to fill out an online survey to share how many of your residents have these three documents. Um, have somebody try to screen all your residents and then uh, see how many, this is really for you, you know, how many of your total number of residents, how many people have that power of attorney, the advanced care planning and pulse? You know, we want to get as high as possible, the 90, 100%, right? Is that impossible? But get as high as possible. Um, that, that will ensure that we're, we're we are addressing people's um, what matters to them. Next slide. And Michaela has office hours if you have any questions regarding filling that out. Or you can email her too. Okay, and that concludes our session today. Anybody has any questions? You wanna share anything else? Thank you. And Michaela put in that uh, the link. Make sure we click on that link because that's going to take you right to the eval and you can complete it right now and get your CMEs. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. That was so my husband in that video, in that airplane. <laughs>